This video is supported by Brilliant.org. I made a point in a live stream one time that the 1800s may have been one of the most transformative centuries in human history. Bear with me. At the beginning of the 18th century, we dressed like this. And by the end of the 18th century, we dressed like this. We went from a mostly agrarian society that was still using animal power to fulfill all of our needs, the same as we had for thousands of years, and by the end we had entered the Industrial Age. Information traveled at the speed of a pony at the beginning of the century, and by the end of the century it was crossing continents almost instantly. Yes, the 1900s gave us cars and planes and the Information Age, but I would argue that the foundations for all of those technologies all started in the 1800s. Change my mind. The point is, sometimes things are done for a certain way for a really long time, and then a paradigm shift occurs that changes everything. The 1800s are one of those moments, but we're also living through one of those right now. Computers today are smarter and faster than they've ever been before, that's obvious, but they're still operating on the same fundamental principles and algorithms that they have been for the last bit major part of the century. But that's about to change. Every technology has to evolve to stay relevant. That's kind of the thing about technology. If it's not moving forward, it's not technology. And a while back I did a video about how our current computer chip technology, let's call it classical computing, is kind of reaching the limit of what it can do. Transistors in our computers are getting so small that quantum effects are starting to become a problem. Electrons can sometimes jump the gap of our transistor's gate through quantum tunneling, which kind of makes the whole binary process of on and off and ones and zeros kind of tricky. This leads to a lot more errors and noise in the processing, which requires more error correction, which requires more processing power, and on and on. It's a vicious cycle. Now there are new chip processes out there and ideas to get around this problem, but ultimately the fundamental basis of our computer technology is kind of reaching its limits. So for decades now, computer scientists have been working on ways to turn the quantum problem into a solution, to find ways to use quantum mechanics to our advantage. In other words, a quantum computer. So to explain how a quantum computer works, you kind of have to back up and get a basic understanding of quantum mechanics in general, which is something that I covered in my video on the double slit experiment, which you can check out right here. But the Reader's Digest version of it basically is that quantum particles like photons and electrons exist in a state called superposition. Now there are several properties of a fundamental particle that you can measure, things like position, spin, charge, velocity, that kind of thing. But for the purposes of this discussion, let's just talk about spin, also known as angular momentum. So an electron can spin up and it can spin down. That's like a binary thing, right? Up, down, on, off, one, zero. This can correlate to the on and off in a transistor in a classical computer chip. The difference in a quantum particle is that it does exist in a state of superposition, meaning it is in all positions at the same time. This is also known as wave-particle duality because it behaves like a wave in its unmeasured state, but then once it's measured, it behaves like a particle. When it's in the unmeasured wave state, it's said to be in a probability function because you can't know that it's in any particular position, but you can know that it's in a probability of being in any particular position. The spin, for example, could be said to be 50% up and 50% down, or 80-20, 90-10, doesn't matter. But it's only when you measure the particle that the waveform collapses and becomes 100% up and 0% down, or vice versa. So that's superposition. The next concept to understand is quantum entanglement, which guess what? I also covered that one in a video. But again, the quick version is that you can pair multiple particles together so that if you measure the properties of one particle, like say the spin, you will automatically know what the spin of the other particle is. Take the particle that we had earlier. It's in a superposition, but if we measured its spin and it was entangled with another particle, then that other particle's waveform would also collapse and we would be able to tell exactly what its spin was too. And this happens immediately, faster than light, no matter how far apart these particles are. This was the spooky action at a distance that Einstein had such a problem with. So by combining the properties of superposition and quantum entanglement, along with a lot of math, you can create quantum logic gates that have the ability to explore multiple options at once because the quantum bits, or qubits as they're called, exist in all states at once. What this means is that applications that a classical computer would have to do sequentially, one at a time, a quantum computer can do all at once, simultaneously. To illustrate this, just imagine that you're in a hotel with a thousand rooms in it, and one of those rooms has a suitcase full of cash, and you want to go find that cash. In a classical computer, you would have to search every single room one at a time before you found it. In a quantum computer, you could basically create a thousand clones of yourself to go check out every single room at once. Now a common misconception and a lot of the hype around quantum computers is that this is going to make a quantum computer better and faster than a classical computer in every way. And that's just not true. There are specific applications for which a quantum computer would be amazing, but 
most of the applications that we use today probably would not be improved upon by a quantum computer over a classical computer. Quantum computers would do a great job of searching databases or running simulations that would require a lot of trial and error because again in a classical computer you'd have to do those one at a time and in a quantum computer you could do it all at once. And the technology is progressing at an amazing rate right now but before we start talking about a timeline of the progress of quantum computers we need to define a few things. So there are different types of quantum computing architectures. There's quantum annealing and gate model quantum computers. Wikipedia defines quantum annealing as such. Quantum annealing, QA, is a metaheuristic for finding the global minimum of a given objective function over a given set of candidate solutions or candidate states by a process using quantum fluctuations. You know, that old chestnut. So what this basically means is that the computer uses the qubit's natural tendency to find the lowest energy state to find the best solution to a problem. Now this is a simpler process, but it's also narrower in scope in terms of what kinds of algorithms it can perform. It also is something called stochastic, which means that it's something that can be simulated on a classical computer. This is actually the model that the D-Wave systems work on. Gate model quantum computing works more on the kind of thing that I was talking about before, using superposition and quantum entanglement to find solutions to problems. Here, instead of letting the quantum processes just kind of naturally do what it's going to do, it tries to sort of manipulate the quantum processes to find the right solution. This is much, much harder to do, but it's also a lot more robust and versatile. It's also non-stochastic, which means that no classical computer in the world can simulate it. Something else to know about quantum computing, especially the gate model quantum computing, is that because of the superposition of states, every time you add a qubit, it doubles in power. So the power of the chip goes up exponentially with every qubit that gets added to the chip. Now, with all that in mind, here's how quantum computing has progressed over the years. You could say that quantum computers have been in the making from the beginning of our understanding of quantum physics, with physicists like Richard Feynman championing research into them in the early 80s. Through the 90s, researchers laid the groundwork for how quantum computers would work, creating the algorithms that would make the devices possible, like Grover's algorithm, which was introduced in 1996. In 1998, researchers at Oxford built the first two-qubit computer that could solve the Deutsch problem, which is a determinist algorithm that's easy for a quantum computer and hard for a classical computer. In 2000, the first working 7-qubit computer was developed at the Los Alamos National Laboratory. These first two computers were called NMR computers, which stood for Nuclear Magnetic Resonance. This basically used magnetic fields to control the spin of the particles. In 2005, the first qubit computer was created at the University of Innsbruck in Austria. A qubit is made of 8 qubits, just like a byte in a classical computer is made up of 8 bits. 2006 saw the first 12-qubit computer from a collaboration between the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, MIT, and Cambridge. And in 2007, D-Wave entered the scene with the first 28-qubit computer chip, which then followed that up with a 128-qubit chip in 2008, a 1,000-qubit chip in 2015, and last year in 2017, they announced a 2,000-qubit chip. Once again, keep in mind that D-Wave works on a quantum annealing platform, which is not as powerful as the gate model quantum computing processor. If you had 2,000 qubits on a gate model version, you would basically be a god. But there have been some rapid advancements on the gate model platform. In 2017, IBM announced a 50-qubit gate model chip, Intel released a 48-qubit chip, and along with that, Microsoft released a quantum programming language, which helps lay the groundwork for commercial quantum applications. And just this month, Google announced a record-breaking 72-qubit chip that they call Bristlecone. With the release of Bristlecone, there's been a lot of talk lately about quantum supremacy, which is the point at which quantum computers officially outperform classical computers in certain applications. Computer scientists theorize that we would get there with a 48-qubit chip, although whether or not we have actually achieved this yet is a subject of hot debate. Because the problem is, quantum computers are still very error-prone. Due to the sensitive nature of the superposition state, these quantum chips have to be heavily shielded from the outside world to keep from messing with the results, and sometimes this means supercooling it down to the nanokelvins. This is not something you want in your laptop. It might phrase you jumblies. This has led the physicist John Preskill to state that he thinks that we've entered a new stage of quantum technology, something he calls noisy intermediate stage quantum, or NISQ. What this means is that we've gotten past the stage of figuring out how the quantum computers work, now we need to make them more accurate. This poses a few challenges. One of the most notable is the fact that quantum computers are considered black box devices, which means that you can't really look inside and see what's going on while it's doing what it's doing without the whole quantum measurement thing becoming an issue, because once you make a measurement, the waveform would collapse. Preskill talked in a recent paper about how error correction is something that's a possibility with these chips. That's definitely an option, but that adds to the complexity and requires more power input, that kind of thing. So the next wave in quantum computing is increasing the stability of the qubits at something closer to room temperature. A group from TU Delft called QTech, working along with 
Intel has created a new silicon-based quantum processor that seeks to put quantum properties in an architecture that's more similar to a classical computer. It's still in the early stages, but it was recently able to complete the Grover algorithm, which is a major test for quantum computers. But the big question you're probably asking is, when are you going to get your hands on a quantum computer? When is a quantum computer going to power your games and your internet and your <laughs> favorite YouTubers? The answer is maybe never. At the moment, it's not expected that quantum computers will ever fully replace classical computers, because as I said before, it's not really an improvement over classical computers in most applications that we use. We're more likely to see innovations in consumer products through things like machine learning and neuromorphic chips. Uh, quantum computing is probably going to be more in the research and lab areas, or possibly cloud-based processing that you can access through AI devices like Siri and Alexa. But just because you won't be holding a quantum chip in your hand doesn't mean it's not going to have a huge impact on the world. Quantum computers would allow much faster database searches, like I said in the hotel analogy earlier, um, which is actually very important considering the amount of information storage in the world is growing exponentially. They could create breakthrough new materials by being able to run thousands of simulations simultaneously. They could boost medical breakthroughs by simulating millions of different variations of protein folding or molecular configurations. Maybe even solving design problems. One of the big things happening in design right now is that AIs are able to kind of work through preliminary design so that designers can then take that and go from there. Quantum computing might help with that quite a bit. Logistics systems will be able to calculate the perfect routes almost immediately by simulating all the different variations at the same time. Same thing is true for production lines, the list goes on. So while it's not going to be in your computer, quantum supremacy is going to make a lot of things that are impossible now possible. And it's going to bleed into our lives in ways that we can't even imagine right now. Welcome to the paradigm shift. Reaching quantum supremacy would be a huge game changer, but it's not the only groundbreaking area of computer science right now. Artificial neural networks and machine learning are creating AIs that are improving every single facet of our lives right now. And if you want to learn more about those topics, there's entire courses dedicated to them at Brilliant.org. Brilliant.org is a unique learning platform because instead of just throwing facts at your face, it walks you through a strategic set of problems so that you can reach the conclusions in your own way. This style of learning not only cements the information in your head because you figured it out yourself, it also builds problem solving skills that you can apply to other areas of your life. You can learn at your own pace and make as many mistakes as you want. It's all part of the process. You can sign up for free at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe, get access to their weekly puzzles and brain teasers, and the first 295 people that sign up for their premium subscription, which gives you access to all their courses, including multiple courses on computer science, will get 20% off your subscription for life. I've been enjoying Brilliant. I think you will too. Brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Links in the description. Thanks to Brilliant for supporting this channel, and a huge shout out to the Patreon supporters who help keep the lights on around here. I've got almost 400 people right now. I can't even believe that. I got some new people who have joined the tribe. I want to call them out real quickly. We've got Brian Brochu, uh, Alexander Vera, Ryan Estevez, Kinsey Beck, Joey, Leslie Knox, Christopher John Settle, uh, Mark Boyce, James Spivey, Stephen Harz, Ashley Wilson, Enrique Chavez, Ron Chesley, Paul Kios, uh, David Fisher, Jackie Richards, Philip Naff. Niles Sankey, Mac Mac, James Twomey, Aether Breaker, and Matthew Purdy. Thank you guys so much. If you would like to join them and get access to free content, behind the scenes type stuff, and hear me murder your name on camera, uh, you can go to patreon.com slash answers with Joe. Cool t-shirts available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Please like and share if you like this video, and if this is your first time here, I invite you to check out some of my other videos, and if you like those, please subscribe. Come back with stuff like this every Monday. Big thanks to Jason for helping out with this video, and all you guys go out there you have an eye-opening week, and I'll see you here next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.